Misha here. If you enjoy our episodes on career pathways in healthcare or the STEM field at large, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, the same team behind the acclaimed A16Z podcast. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with venture capital investors and A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. So whether you're interested in building a new digital healthcare company or your company is advancing a new novel medicine, Raising Health sheds light on some of the opportunities and obstacles along the founder's journey. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights, actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. Wow. I it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. We're coming to San Francisco for the Bay Area Science Festival, October 26th. StoryCollider.org for more info. This week's story is from John Rennie. It was recorded in May 2015 at Littlefield in Brooklyn. Listen, don't we all really love stories about ragtag bands of, of smart, nerdy misfits who fight the good fight against oppressive killjoys? Of course we do. Think of movies like, like Revenge of the Nerds, Nerds vs. the Jocks, or, or Ghostbusters, when it's the Ghostbusters vs. That, that, that petty EPA bureaucrat, or, uh, or, 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 or the TV show MASH, where you had the, you know, the fun surgeons against chinless Major Frank Burns. And, uh, I am happy to say that uh, at one point in my life, back when I was an editor at Scientific American, I actually had the pleasure of getting to live out exactly this kind of conflict. And it was great, great fun right up until I became the oppressive killjoy. I became the petty bureaucrat. I became the chinless Frank Burns. Um, the only thing in any of this that maybe makes that bitter pill a little easier to swallow is that on at least one occasion, I might have played a part in preventing a major catastrophe that might have cost thousands of lives here in New York City. I'll explain how that works. Um, so, uh, you know... The, the, the editors at Scientific American, like at, at most science publications, are, are really, they're kind of typically a sort of mad scientist club of people who have all of the, the passionate curiosities and quirky idiosyncrasies associated with both researchers and journalists, two of the best adjusted groups of people you've ever known. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, when I was there among them, ooh, this, is, this is how we were. You know, we were, what, we were, we were idealistic about knowledge, and we were cynical about power. And uh, we were very, very aggressively pro-personal liberty and, uh, and freedom and creativity. And uh, we were almost deliberately obtuse about at least half of the usual social niceties. And uh, though we would never, of course, really say this, we felt that we were hugely superior uh, to all of the drones on the business side and our own managers who would, of course, make and enforce all of the petty, stupid office rules we had to live by. So, for example, there were the thermostat wars. Um, <laughs> We had started getting these memos from the Human Resources Department uh, asking us to please stop adjusting the thermostats 
because they said all of the thermostats on our floor were perfectly set to achieve the optimum balance for everyone's comfort, which seemed wildly unlikely given that portions of the floor were teeth-chatteringly cold, and other parts were just greenhouse hot. Um, so we would just keep right on readjusting the thermostats to make things more comfortable. And uh, finally, human resources retaliated by putting a plastic lockbox <laughs> over all of the thermostats. Now, you don't do that to a bunch of science-minded people who carry a grudge because we just took that as a personal challenge. So uh, I and some of the others, we, we started developing tools made out of straightened paper clips and bits of wire with which we could reach in through slots in the plastic box and still keep changing the thermostat. <laughs> and I don't think human resources ever figured out what was going on there. Um, there was also the time that uh, management, in its wisdom, decided to put all new electronic locks on the front door of the office. Now, these were great because, uh, of course, if you were walking out, motion detectors would detect your approach and the door would fly open, unless it didn't and you'd bounce off the glass door. Um, but the bigger problem was that when coming in, you had to use a, a, a magnetic card. You'd swipe that card and then it would pop open and, and you could walk in, except that, of course, the editors at least half the time were always forgetting their cards or accidentally demagnetizing their cards, because that's a thing that you do a lot when you're an editor at Scientific American. And, uh, and, and so it was, you know, we constantly had to figure out other ways to get in. So we all started developing our, our own different hacks. And my personal specialty, uh, was uh, one of the discovery that, that if you just took a piece of paper and slid it under the door and waved it around, <laughs> it would set off that motion detector and the door would pop open. So literally, anybody with a piece of paper <laughs> could walk into our office at any time. So this kind of thing happened a lot, and it was all great fun until one day, somehow, through a peculiar quirk, I actually got named to be the new editor-in-chief, which made me a manager, which meant that I was now the authority compelled to herd the anti-authority cats. Uh, which meant that I was now the one who had to keep trying to get them to do things like meet the deadlines on the copy they had to write. And uh, I had to write lots of these different sorts of passive aggressive memos of things like, hey guys, uh, you know those dishes in the sink aren't gonna wash themselves, <laughs> so how's about we clean them, okay? Started off as, how about we clean them, okay, you jerks? And I'd erase that part before I'd send it. Um, you know, so, and I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just, it's a kind of like office life Stockholm syndrome that would kick in. But um, I have to admit that my attitude toward the editors started to change a little bit. Because I previously had been part of the fun gang. And now, I don't know, I, I just, I started to see a lot more reasons why it was important to enforce some of these rules. Because sometimes it was important to contain the costs and to keep people employed and to, to try to stop some of the more charismatic megafauna personalities in the office from <laughs> running roughshod over some of the less assertive species. And, uh, and again, I mean, I'm not, I'm not proud to say this, but I mean, you know, when you're managing an office full of people whose average IQ is 145, and yet you realize that all of them are afraid to pick up the dead mouse behind the photocopier, and you're the only one who will, it's, it's really hard to escape feeling like maybe you really are the only adult in the room. <laughs> and you have to kind of question their judgment a lot. And that's where things stood right up until October of 2001. Now, this was of course just weeks after 9-11. Fears of terrorism 
at an all-time high. People didn't, you know, were worried about all kinds of threats, uh, bombs, dirty nukes that might go off, uh, biological warfare. Um, people were in a panic. And, uh, you know, we were trying to think of stories that we could write to, to develop against some of this. And one of the editors had, had a really good idea for a story. George, um, very smart guy, very, very always, always very calm exterior, like 98% of the time he was very calm. Sometimes he'd get agitated and that was a whole other thing. But, but, uh, but, but he had this like, great idea for a story about trying to check up on the security associated with uh, ordering chemicals for laboratories. Now, if you work in a laboratory, you might actually even know this already, if you need different sorts of chemical reagents, you would, in these days, you just get on the phone and you would just say, hey, I just need this and this and this in these quantities, and they would send it to your laboratory. And the problem was that there were some fears surfacing that maybe the chemical supply houses were not actually being careful enough about watching for suspicious types of orders, things that could, say, be going into making bombs or other kinds of dangerous things. And I said, well, this is a great idea for a story. Go, George. Go work on this story. And, and that was great. And about a week later, George comes back into me and gives me an update. And as I say, normally a very calm guy, but even he seems a little excited at the moment because he, he's saying, the story is going great. Uh, and it turns out there really are a lot of serious, serious lapses uh, that they were discovering. And they found the most interesting, fun way of dramatizing this. And I said, what is it? Because I can't wait to hear. And he says, well, we went online and we looked up what you would need to make the nerve gas sarin, one of the most deadly nerve gases in the world. And it turns out it's only really like three chemicals. And uh, so then we just called the chemical supply house and uh, ordered a bunch of this, and they sent it to us. <laughs> and, and I said, well, uh, because a part of me is thinking, well, this is a fantastic story. But the other part of me is hanging up on that part about, sent it to us? What, what, what do you mean, sent it to us? And George said, they sent it here, to the office. It's, it's down the hall in my office now. You want to come see? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Quite a lot, as it turned out. I ran down the hall, and sure enough, there it was, the ingredients for making nerve gas. Do you, do you want to know what they are? Sure, why not? Well, let's see. First of all, you had the, the great big jug of uh, dimethylmethyl uh, phosphonate. Um, that was a clear liquid in a big plastic jug, and that one just had a big sign on it that said, TOXIC! And then you, had, then you had the other bottle of another clear liquid, um, and that would have been the uh, phosphorus trichloride. Now, that one was in a, 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 another bottle with plastic over it, uh, but that's because it had signs on it that said toxic and corrosive. <laughs> and then there was also a third jar that contained sodium fluoride, um, which I think they sometimes give to kids for their teeth. And I don't really want to get in the con connection about that. But the point is, the reagents are all just sitting there. And there was also some alcohol there. And I was glad there was some alcohol, because I really felt like drinking a lot at this point. Because I'm, I, what, the words I'm trying to perform and ask George are, do you have any idea of what you've done? Do you, do you realize that you've just committed an act that is essentially indistinguishable from one of domestic terrorism? But the actual question I asked him at the time is, uh, so just how much nerve gas would this make? And George said, well, it's a little hard to say, of course, but um, you know, if you in theory uh, mixed it perfectly and you had a system for distributing it evenly, there would be enough here to kill 10,000 people. So that was a fun thing to have in the office. As he's saying this, I'm pinwheeling through my mind are, are all the different sorts of concerns and worries that you have when you're an office manager in a situation like that. Like, 
what happens if this stuff leaks and starts poisoning people in the office? Or what am I supposed to tell my own bosses if this leaks and starts poisoning people in the offices? Or what am I supposed to tell the police? Or the other authorities? Or the FBI? Because I'm pretty sure that if I explain to them that we got the ingredients for nerve gas just to prove a point, they're not going to be as sympathetic to it as I would like. So I'm worried about this, and uh, I send George off to go finish his story, because, you know, deadlines. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that night, though, I mean, I'm, I'm still in a frenzy, because I realize this story is, is, is going off to the printer imminently, and I'm thinking, oh, God, we have to get rid of these chemicals now. We have to get rid of these chemicals right now. And not just for all of the obvious office safety reasons that I'm talking about. What I'm worried about is the distinct possibility in my own mind of somebody who reads this story deciding they're going to come break into our office and steal all the ingredients for the nerve gas that we've decided to keep in the office down the hall. This would be the office that, as you recall, it's possible to open up with a piece of newspaper. <laughs> I go into George the next day, and I tell him, we have to get rid of this now, now, we have to get rid of this now. I think that's probably roughly the tone of voice I used. Um, George, very calm, said, ah, yes, yes, all right, I'll, uh, I'll get on that. And I'm saying, George, have you given any thought at all to how we're, how we're going to get rid of this stuff? Because I'm pretty sure we can't just pour it over the dirty dishes in the sink. <laughs> and he says, uh, well, I've, uh, I've been thinking that uh, probably I will try to contact some scientist friends who have laboratories here in New York City, and I will see if any of them will take these things off of our hands. And I said, no. No, you can't just find one of them. You have to find at least two, because we have to break up the set of chemicals. Because if you don't break up the set of chemicals, you've just handed somebody else a do-it-yourself nerve gas kit. And George says, ah, good point. And he goes off, and I fall into a sweat. And uh, I check in with him a day later, and I ask, how's it going? And he says, it's turned out to be surprisingly hard to find anyone who's willing to take this off our hands. And I say, it's not surprising at all! <laughs> but he comes back to me the next day, and he says, oh, good news, the chemicals are gone. I found some people who are willing to take them, and I have taken them myself, and they're out of the office, and they are no longer our problem. And I felt such relief that I didn't even ask how he had done it, because I was pretty sure that it involved George in a cardboard box with deadly toxins in a cab going to places like Columbia. Um, well, as it turned out, George's story came out, and it, it got a lot of attention. George actually showed up on the Today Show to talk about all of this. Uh, nothing ever happened with our batch of chemicals. I and my attorneys would like to assure you of that, very surely. Um, and in fact, the various chemical supply houses did uh, say they were all going to tighten up all of their, their own procedures to try to make sure that nothing would happen in the future for this kind of thing, and, and that's how things stand. And uh, so it's a great relief, and when I look back at all of this, um, you know, I would like to think that I... I had a part in trying to make sure that nothing bad happened. But as I even listened to my own version of this story, as you're probably listening, George, the other editors, for all, I had my worries about their responsibility in this issue. They, in fact, were perfectly responsible in their own slightly off-kilter way. So once again, really, the ragtag band of geeky misfits has uh, won out over the figure of authority. Damn it! <laughs> Thank you. That was John Rennie, 
John is a science writer, editor, and lecturer based in New York. Viewers of the Weather Channel know him as the host of the original series Hacking the Planet and co-host of the hit special The Truth About Twisters. He is also the editorial director of Science for McGraw-Hill Education, overseeing its highly respected Access Science online reference and the McGraw-Hill Encyclopedia of Science and Technology. He served as editor-in-chief of Scientific American between 1994 and 2009. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, Skylar Bear, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Rose Evanleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Littlefield for hosting the show and to Science Magazines for sometimes protecting us. Thanks for listening. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.